But right now, we're going to turn to news here at home. This week, a grand jury in New York declined to indict the police officer involved in the choking death of Eric Garner in Staten Island. This decision came one week after a St. Louis grand jury decided not to indict now former Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson for shooting and killing Michael Brown. This decision comes in a week when we have learned that the police officer who shot and killed 12-year-old Tamir Rice on a Cleveland playground just two seconds after arriving on the scene previously was deemed unfit for duty by a neighboring police force. These deaths and the sense of injustice surrounding them will forever mark how many Americans remember 2014. But right now, I want to invite you to draw your focus a little wider and think not only about this week or this year, but also about this decade. Ten years ago, in January 2004, 19-year-old Timothy Stansberry Jr. decided to take a shortcut to a friend's birthday party. He had to pass through a stairwell in a Brooklyn apartment building. As he emerged from the stairwell, he was shot to death by a police officer who was patrolling the area. No indictment was issued against Richard Neary, the officer who shot the unarmed team. That same year, a decade ago in 2004, the Hollywood blockbuster Crash premiered at the Toronto Film Festival. Now, this film purported to illuminate America's ongoing racial angst by following a set of intertwined human stories. The key moment of the movie is when white LAPD officer John Ryan, played by Matt Dillon, saves an African-American woman portrayed by Fandi Newton from a burning car. But you see, the fictional officer Ryan is no stranger to this woman. He encountered her earlier in the film when he demanded that she and her husband exit their car during a traffic stop. When she refuses to comply with his demands, Officer Ryan sexually assaults her under the guise of a standard pat-down. And this violation of a black body by an armed officer for the sole purpose of asserting his power and authority is a gut-wrenching scene. But the scene where that same officer saves his victim from certain death, risking his life to drag her to safety, wipes the slate clean of the residual evil of racial and sexual assault. It restores Officer Ryan's humanity and shows the audience that no one is all bad. Crash went on to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. Ten years ago, in this country, we created, consumed, and applauded a cultural product that redeems rather than punishes a white police officer who abuses and degrades a black body. According to the CDC, between 1968 and 2011, black people were between two to eight times more likely to die at the hands of law enforcement than whites. In August of 2005, less than a year after Crash premiered, Hurricane Katrina caused a massive failure of federal levees that were supposed to protect New Orleans. Low-lying African-American communities were hit hardest. But elected officials initially reacted with more concern for property than for the men, women, children, and elderly who were trapped in the flooded city without adequate food, water, or medicine. Louisiana's Democratic governor, Kathleen Blanco, was reported to be just furious about the lawlessness and pledge we'll do what it takes to bring law and order to our region. The city's African-American mayor, Ray Nagan, ordered most of the city's dramatically limited police force to halt rescue efforts and to concentrate on stopping looters who had grown more aggressive. Then, on September 4th, while the city was still in chaos, four New Orleans police officers opened fire on a group of unarmed civilians on the Danzinger Bridge. Two were killed. One was 17-year-old. James Brissett. It took nearly six years to obtain a federal civil rights conviction of the officers, but that conviction was overturned when it was revealed that prosecuting attorneys were posting messages in the online comment section of the local paper. There is still no resolution for the families of that unarmed man and boy gunned down by police officers in the aftermath of a storm. Between 2003 and 2009, the Department of Justice reported that 4,813 people died while in the process of arrest or in the custody of law enforcement. Three years after Katrina, America did something extraordinary with an unprecedented multiracial coalition that spanned from coast to coast and broke the solid South, America elected an African-American Democrat to be president of the United States. The next year? Henry Louis Gates, the Alphonse Fletcher University professor and director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, was arrested 
by Cambridge, Massachusetts police for breaking into his own home. When the new president had the audacity to offer his opinion that arresting a tenured full professor from Harvard for entering his own property constituted acting stupidly, the opinion about who had been victimized in this moment shifted dramatically. And in the end, the officer who arrested Gates was invited to the White House for a beer. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, African Americans were twice as likely to be arrested and almost four times as likely to experience the use of force during encounters with police. In 2011, the state of Georgia executed Troy Davis for the murder of a police officer in 1989. Davis was executed over the objections of a global community of activists. Executed despite the fact that serious questions remained about his guilt. Executed even though many of the witnesses whose testimony secured his conviction had recanted. In 96 percent of states where there have been reviews of race and the death penalty, there was a pattern of either race of victim or race of defendant discrimination or both. In 2012, 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was shot and killed in Sanford, Florida, on his way home from the store while he was carrying Skittles and iced tea. It took 46 days for George Zimmerman to be charged with second-degree murder for killing the unarmed teen. Later that year, we reelected President Obama. Six months after President Obama's second inaugural address, George Zimmerman was found not guilty. 80% of black men voters, 18 to 29, voted for President Obama in 2012. And now, 2014. July 17th, 2014, Eric Garner dies after being put in a chokehold by New York City police officers arresting him for selling untaxed loose cigarettes. No indictment. August 5th, 2014, John Crawford is shot to death by police at a suburban Ohio Walmart. He was walking around the store holding a BB gun that is sold in the store. No indictment. August 9th, 2014, Michael Brown is shot and killed by Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson. Brown was unarmed. Wilson initially stopped Brown for jaywalking. No indictment. Writing for The Guardian, Pulitzer Prize winner Isabel Wilkerson considered the contemporary deaths of black men at the hands of police officers against a backdrop of American lynching. Writing, not terribly long ago, in a country that many people misremember if they knew it at all, a black person was killed in public every four days for often the most mundane of infractions, or rather accusation of infractions, for taking a hog, making boastful remarks, for stealing 75 cents. For the most banal of missteps, the penalty could be an hours-long spectacle of torture and lynching. No trial, no jury, no judge, no appeal. Now, well into a new century, as a family in Ferguson, Missouri, buries yet another American teenager killed at the hands of authorities, the rate of police killings of black Americans is nearly the same as the rate of lynchings in the early decades of the 20th century. About twice a week, or every three or four days, an African American has been killed by a white police officer. Wilkerson invites us into a world known by our grandparents, one of disenfranchisement, of encoded second-class citizenship enforced by the terror of lynch law. The world our parents changed when they marched and spoke and stood and sat and studied and demanded equality, a world my students and my children were never supposed to know. This generation who cast their first ballot to realize a never fully articulated yet still profound desire to experience the American state embodied in a black body, this generation was supposed to inherit an America finally prepared to fulfill its aspiration, to be a nation by and for all the people, a country governed by laws, a union watered in the blood of the martyred, martyred but blooming forth with the unrealized potential for equality. The arc of the moral universe was meant to be bending finally toward justice. Instead, they inherited this decade. A decade of young black bodies felled by bullets. A decade of assault on the dignity and bodies of black people that goes unrecognized and unpunished, even as those same black bodies are held lethally accountable for the slightest infraction, the most minor crime, or even just a trespass against someone else's sense of security. 
A decade where even in our blockbuster imagination, where we can imagine life on other planets, we cannot bring ourselves to imagine holding police accountable for their actions against black bodies. This is the decade when they have come of age, and so this generation lies down in the streets in New York, in Detroit, in Chicago, in D.C., in Ferguson. They lie down as though dead, asking, is this the only acceptable position for a young black body? Is this the only future we can expect? And with their bodies stretched out in our nation's streets, they indict us all.